whole lot of comebacks could be prevented if people just had a better understanding of the systems. We can't just assume the salesperson always explains everything to the customers, and you know every customer is not going to read the owner's manual. Some of these comebacks can be resolved by just explaining the system to the customer and not writing a repair order. Even Dave, an ASE certified technician, got something out of all those tapes. Hi, Chuck. How was your weekend? Oh, don't get me started. If Steve would have just taken the time to explain those security locks to the customer the first time, he never would have come back to the dealer. Hey, Chuck, how was the weekend? I just finished reading the script for the 95 Riviera. Gonna be something else, huh? <sighs> Later, guys. I haven't seen him like this since the engines program. <sighs> hey, Chuck, we need to talk to you. Uh, maybe later. He's just got to understand how much we need this one. One, two, three. We got to talk. I'm listening. I know we already did a know-how on comeback prevention. So? We need another one. Only this time, we need to focus on instant comebacks. What's that? Here's what I'm thinking. A customer says his door's always unlocked when he shifts into park. But... Hold on. The RO says check rear door locks. So, the tech checks the locks and says everything checks out okay. The customer leaves and then finds out the locks are doing the same thing. Chuck, I'm trying to tell you, that's how the door locks are supposed to work. Exactly. But the customer doesn't know that. So he comes back to the dealership angry. That's not much of a program, Chuck. Oh, really? Let me tell you about last Friday night. I had a few buddies over from the dealership days. The big game was just about to start. And after all that, she locks the keys in the trunk. Get out of here. I was a service advisor for five years. I never heard anything like that. Steven, take off your shoes. Uh-oh. Yeah. Jeez. I'll never make that mistake again. Way to go. You mess up Laura's rug, you're late. Look, you even forgot the beer. Again? Hey, this time I have a good excuse. Okay, let's have it. Then you're making a beer run. Fine. Anyway, I was almost out the door and a guy pulls up in an ultra. Boy, was he made. I just had this car in here the other day. Rear door locks, right? Yeah, that's right. Anyway, I took my boss and his wife out to dinner the other night. The rear doors won't open from the inside, so... Every time we stopped, I had to let them out. Pretty embarrassing. Yeah, I can imagine. I'm really sorry you had to go through that. Now, let me make sure I understand this correctly. You could open the rear doors from the outside, but not from the inside. Yeah, that's right. OK, let's take a look. See this here? What's that? That's your child security rear door lock switch. My what? See, when it's in this position, the doors are only open from the outside. So kids can't open it from the inside. Oh, see? That ought to do it. I didn't even know that was there, let alone touch it. <laughs> well, where do you get your car washed? Oh, those crooks down the street. Uh, they hand dry them there, don't they? Yeah, they open the doors, they wipe everything down, and... Hey, wait a minute. You think they keep hitting that switch with their towel? I've seen it happen. Next time, check the rear doors after the car wash and reset them if you have to. Hey, thanks a lot. Hey, no problem. All right. Sorry about that. Great story, Steve. Now, how about this for a story? Once upon a time, there were three guys waiting for the game to start, and one of them was supposed to bring the beer. Oh, I can take a hint. Mm-hmm. Uh, hey, Steve. Yeah. Shoes. Oops. Be right back. So, you got surround sound on that thing? Yeah, I just got it today. How's it sound? I don't know. The salesman walked me through it, but uh, with all these buttons. Boy, Chuck, 
You don't even have the know-how to get sound out of a simple TV? Ha ha ha. <laughs> hey, don't feel too bad. Just the other day, this guy came in beefing about the radio and his Ultra. So what you're saying is you can only set five preset stations, is that it? Yeah, the 92 I had, I could set nine. By pressing two buttons at once, right? Yeah. Okay. You see that little AM thingy? Uh-huh. Okay, now, you see the little FM1 thingy? Yep. Okay, we go ahead and set a station. All right, there. Mm -hmm. And now set four more. I know, but what about the rest? Well, see the little FM2 thingy? Oh, five stations for FM1 and five for FM2. Sure beats trying to press two buttons at once, huh? Yeah, sure does. He's back already? Hey, man. Sorry, uh -oh. I guess I didn't see Shoes the Shoes again. Bob, long time no see. Dave! Chuck! I, <clears throat> I mean, Hollywood! Say, is your head as big on that screen as it is in real life? Do I smell gear lube? No, it's just Dave. <laughs> you know, Chuck, we really miss you down at the old dealership. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really? You got any batteries in that thing, Ace? Yes, uh, they are right <laughs> here. Dave, isn't it nice that even Chuck can overlook the obvious? Yeah, batteries. I see a lot of keyless entry comebacks just due to batteries. Hey, guys, it works! Let's, uh, check it out with this tape. What a coincidence. Some game. A portable transmitter and receiver module are used to lock or unlock all doors. To unlock the driver's door, press the unlock button once. When the signal is received and decoded by the module, battery power unlocks only the driver's door. The module also turns on the interior lights. To open all doors, press the unlock button twice within five seconds. The module powers the system to operate the door lock motors, unlocking all doors. To lock the doors, press the lock button once. The system locks all doors. To unlock the trunk, press the trunk button once. The module grounds an output to the trunk lid release relay where battery power operates the trunk lid release solenoid. Please keep in mind that the transmitter works up to about 15 or 20 feet away. On Park Avenue in LeSabre, a transmitter can reprogram the module here at Terminal G of the Data Link Connector, or DLC, which is located under the instrument panel. Park Avenue and LeSabre use the Remote Accessory Control, or Rack Module, to perform all keyless entry functions. All other Buicks use a Remote Keyless Entry, or RKE, module, mounted in different locations. To program the system, first locate the programming terminal. Second, with the ignition off, if the connector has two terminals, jumper them together. If the connector has only one terminal, jumper it to a good ground. Third, allow the system to cycle the door locks from lock to unlock. Now, within five seconds, press any transmitter button once. Allow the locks to cycle again. When programming both transmitters, press one button from the second transmitter. Allow the locks to cycle a third time. Fourth, verify operation of each transmitter. Whoa! All right. That's right. Lucky that new Skylock of mine has that battery rundown protection feature or I probably would have been late. Probably. Hey, the line at the store was unreal. And to top it off, I left the interior lights on. But once I realized what was going on, I knew it was just the inadvertent power control kicking in. Hmm. I'm surprised you knew that, Steve. That's like this customer of mine. She drives like, what, once a month? And then she asks me why the radio presets are gone. <laughs> you know, that's one most customers don't know. Here we go again. The battery rundown protection feature can be found on all Skylarks from 1992 through the 94 model year. All functions of the system are controlled through the multifunction alarm module. The battery rundown protection feature performs two independent functions, parasitic power control and inadvertent power control.
The parasitic power control output of the module controls a switch that can interrupt the supply of battery voltage to the electronic brake control module, instrument cluster, radio and remote keyless entry module. The module incorporates a timer which receives input from the vehicle speed sensor. This information is used to calculate the distance the car is driven. The parasitic power control timer turns off the supply of battery voltage if the vehicle has been parked for three days on vehicles with more than 15 total miles or if the vehicle has been parked for 24 days on vehicles with less than 15 total miles. The mileage is used to determine if the vehicle is in transit, dealer storage, or if the vehicle is placed in service. Disconnecting the battery or module will result in the module's mileage counter being reset. Inadvertent power control output of the module controls the supply of battery voltage to the following lights. Courtesy, header, rear quarter, vanity mirror, reading, instrument panel compartment, and luggage compartment. Once the ignition key is turned off, the output timer inside the module will shut off power to the lights. After two to four minutes, if the vehicle has accumulated less than 15 miles, and after 18 to 22 minutes, if the vehicle has accumulated more than 15 miles. The inadvertent power control output can be reset by opening or closing either front door, turning the ignition switch to run, or by shutting off any interior lights that were left on accidentally. Pretty cool guys, huh? Oh yeah, just awesome. Can we put on the game now? Okay, okay, you want the game? Here's the game. Hey Chuck, great picture. Okay, Mr. Video, what do you think is wrong with it? I really don't know, but hey, it plays tapes great. Ever get the feeling you've been suckered in? Yep. The 1994 Skylark and Century both use the multifunction alarm module to provide automatic door locks. The 94 Regal uses the chime module. When shifting out of park, the system locks the doors. On Skylark, the Prindle module in the electronic instrument cluster signals the module when the vehicle is in park. On Century and Regal, the transaxle position switch is used. When the module detects a shift from park, power is sent to operate the door lock system once per ignition cycle. And for 1994, a new unlock feature has been added. A door unlock module unlocks the doors when the ignition is switched off. This feature can be disabled by removing the door unlock fuse. 1991 to 1994 Roadmasters and 1993 Riviera automatic lock systems are controlled by the remote keyless entry or RKE module. When the RKE module sees a shift from park, and all door jam switches show that all doors are closed, the module locks the doors. If one door is open or the interior lights are on, the module will not lock or unlock the doors. Something different for these cars is a relock feature. If a door is opened with the engine running, the transmission in any gear other than park or neutral and the brake pedal applied when the door is closed again, it will automatically relock. To disable the automatic door locks on a 1994 Roadmaster, just reprogram one or both of the keyless entry transmitters. The remote keyless entry programming terminal is located in the trunk for sedans. Begin by grounding the terminal. Within five seconds, press the lock, unlock, and trunk lid unlock buttons in sequence three times. The door locks will cycle three times to indicate that the system has been disabled. To reinstate the system, reprogram both transmitters. For 1994 Park Avenue, the rack module operates the door locks. When the module sees a shift from park and all doors are closed, the module locks the doors. Similarly, a shift back to park unlocks the doors. Input hardware includes the transaxle position switch and four door lock latch switches. In park, the rack module receives power through the transaxle position switch. In reverse or drive, the switch opens the circuit to the rack module. 
The rack module detects that all doors are closed when there is not a door lock or latch switch input. To lock the doors, the module sends power to the door lock relay. When the driver shifts back into park, the module sends power to the unlock relay, where battery power unlocks the doors. This system can be reprogrammed. To do this, press and hold a door lock switch, shift out of and then into park, and release the switch. Now, a shift into park keeps the doors locked. To reprogram, follow the same steps, but this time, hold the unlock button. Huh, that, that's new? I thought I had the 94s down cold. Well, now you do. There's just a lot of little things that you need to know about. Like what? I watch almost all the know-hows with the techs. Almost, huh? How'd you like 167? You know, the 94 car show? Uh, missed that one. You know, I bet you missed the new info on the 94 traction control system. Don't sweat it, Steve. I have a feeling we're all about to catch up on that. Park Avenue and LeSabre models use the Tevis Mark IV anti-lock braking system to reduce wheel spin at the front drive wheels during acceleration on slippery surfaces. 1992 to 1993 systems work at speeds below 25 miles per hour while the 1994 system works at all vehicle speeds. 1992 and 93 systems control wheel slip by applying brake pressure to the spinning wheel. Like anti-lock, the EBTCM monitors and compares front and rear wheel speed sensor frequencies. When it determines that one or both front wheels begin to spin faster than the rear wheels, the EBTCM enters traction control mode. The EBTCM then simultaneously energizes the pump motor and isolation valves inside the PMV. The isolation valves are energized to allow operation of the front brakes only. Once isolated, the pump motor provides hydraulic pressure and the inlet and outlet valves are cycled by the EBTCM to control the speed of the slipping wheels. Drive torque is directed through the transaxle to the wheel with better traction. On the other hand, the 94 system maintains traction through a combination of braking, fuel delivery, and spark control. When the 94 system senses a slipping wheel, it can control it by pulsing the brakes, retarding ignition timing, leaning out the air-fuel mixture, opening the EGR valve, cutting off fuel delivery on up to three cylinders, or any or all of the above in any order the system deems necessary. If the service brakes are applied while in traction control mode, the EBTCM receives input from a pressure switch inside the PMV and the cruise shift interlock brake switch. With these inputs, the EBTCM disengages the traction control system. The 1994 system also incorporates a traction on-off switch. When the traction off switch is activated, the system will be disabled for the current ignition cycle only. It may be necessary to turn the traction control system off if the vehicle becomes stuck and must be rocked back and forth. The EBCM also runs an initialization that tests all electronic and hydraulic systems for problems. Some brake pedal feedback is normal and can be felt just after the ignition is cycled and when the vehicle reaches a predetermined speed. If the system senses a problem during the initialization period, it will illuminate the ABS and traction off indicators and will set and store any diagnostic trouble codes associated with the problem. Come to think of it, you know, lots of customers do gripe about strange noises when they drive off after startup. You know, I guess that's just the ABS initializing. Yeah, that's the same sound the level control compressor makes. I'm one step ahead of you, Dave. Electronic level control is available on most Buicks. An actuator arm is connected between the rear suspension control arm and the electronic level control height sensor, which is mounted to the body. As the arm moves, a solid state unit inside the height sensor detects the motion and operates switches to control airflow to the rear struts. 
If weight is added to the vehicle, a height sensor turns on a compressor and air is pumped into the rear struts until the vehicle is level. If weight is removed from the vehicle, a solenoid inside the compressor opens up and releases air from the rear struts. Each time the ignition is turned on, the compressor will activate after a 35 to 40 second delay. The height sensor also delays compressor operation after a change in vehicle height. On Park Avenue and LeSabre models, the delay is between 17 and 27 seconds. On Roadmasters, the delay is between 8 and 15 seconds. This prevents system operation during normal ride conditions. The height sensor also limits compressor runtime to 4.5 to 7 minutes on Park Avenue and LeSabre models and a maximum of 6 minutes on Roadmasters. This prevents continuous compressor operation in the case of a severe system leak. Yeah, but that level control has come in handy ever since Laura got pregnant, huh? <laughs> Shh! Quiet! You want to get me killed? <laughs> but you know, with all those hot flashes she's having, she's given that dual zone a real workout. Let me guess. That's a dual zone tape, right? Bingo. Know How 164. The CJ2 Dual Zone Automatic Climate Control System is designed to automatically maintain a selected cabin temperature regardless of outside temperature changes. The system incorporates a passenger side control panel that allows the passenger to adjust air temperature on their side of the cabin. When in auto mode, air exits the outlets in different orders according to ambient temperature. In cold winter-like temperatures, Air exits the lower heater, both defroster and lower heater, and the instrument panel and lower heater outlets. In cool spring-like temperatures, air exits the outlets in the same order as winter-like temperatures, only for a shorter amount of time. The air exiting the instrument panel outlets will be measurably warmer than air exiting the floor outlets. In warm summer temperatures, air exits the instrument panel outlets with the recirculation valve closed. Then, the recirculation valve opens and air continues to exit the instrument panel outlets. In hot desert temperatures, air exits the outlets the same as in warm temperatures, only for a longer amount of time. When the blower is in the auto mode, blower speed is automatically controlled by the system programmer. The high and low buttons can be used to manually adjust blower speed. On 1991 through mid-92 models, the auto blower will not operate until engine coolant reaches 100 degrees Fahrenheit. As engine coolant temperature increases, the blower rapidly climbs to high and the display bars on the control head will increase to 6. Like previous models, the auto blower on mid-1992 through 94 models will not operate until coolant temperature reaches 100 degrees Fahrenheit. As engine coolant temperature increases, the blower gradually climbs to high and the display bars increase to 6. Once the selected temperature on the control head has been reached, the blower speed will gradually drop off. I had a guy in the other day who thought his blower motor was going out. Now I know it was just the blower delay. That guy who thought he had the problem with the blower motor, uh, was he driving a blue park? Sure was. Yeah, he must have come back in. I talked to him yesterday. He wasn't very happy. Don't worry, Steve. I bailed you out. I explained to him about the blower motor delays. He was glad his car was okay, but then he started asking me questions about the memory seats, how the oil life monitor worked, and pass key too. The memory seat and mirror option is available on Park Avenue and LeSabre models. The memory seat and mirror control module controls three seat motors located in the driver's seat. Each seat motor has a cable running from it that moves the seat. Each cable has a position sensor mounted near it that allows the module to remember seat position. When the memory select switch is activated, the module can store the voltage levels it receives from the sensors so that the same seating position can be recalled. Mirror positions can also be stored into the module. Each mirror contains two motors. 
One motor moves the mirror up and down, while the other moves the mirror from side to side. Like the seats, mirror position is determined by the voltage level sent to the module. This way, when the memory select switch is activated, the module can store the voltage levels it receives from the sensors so that they can be recalled later. To store positions, turn the ignition on and make sure the gear selector is in park. Adjust the seat and mirrors to a desired location. Press the set button and within five seconds press the left side of the memory switch for memory position one. If a second customized setting is desired, readjust the seat and mirrors and store the settings using the right side for memory position two. The system also incorporates an exit button. When it's pressed, the seat moves all the way down and then back. The oil life monitor is available on the 1991 to 1994 Park Avenue, the 1992 to 1994 LeSabre, and is a new 1994 Roadmaster feature. Over time, the grueling conditions encountered inside an engine can cause viscosity breakdown. Normally, there's no way to know the exact point when this breakdown actually occurs. After only 3,000 miles, combustion contamination, water, acids, dust, and tiny metal particles reduce the protective effectiveness of the oil. And that's why Buick recommends regular oil changes. The Oil Life Monitor informs Buick owners when it's time to have this service performed by illuminating the Change Oil Soon indicator. If the indicator is lit continuously, a code has been set in the system. A service technician must then locate and correct the problem. In older systems, reset the module with a small diameter tool inserted through the hole in the lower hush panel. Lightly press the button for five seconds, then release it. For 1994 models, a reset button is housed behind the glove box door. Press and hold the button for five seconds to reset the system after each oil change. The indicator should flash four times, then go out, as a message that the module has been reset. The Passkey 2 system is known as a passive theft deterrent system. In other words, the driver doesn't have to do anything to arm or disarm the system. It works whenever a key is inserted or removed from the ignition. When the key is inserted into the ignition cylinder, the key's resistor pellet completes a 5-volt circuit. The module compares or decodes the resistance provided by the pellet to a value stored in memory. If the module sees the correct resistance value when the ignition is turned to start, the starter enable relay is activated and the PCM enables fuel control to allow the engine to start. If the wrong key is used, the module will shut down the PCM and de-energize the starter enable relay. The system will illuminate the security indicator and will be disabled for approximately three and a half to four minutes. This time period discourages someone from randomly trying different keys with different resistor pellets in an attempt to start the vehicle. Wow, I guess that takes care of that. Hey Chuck, does passkey have anything to do with the universal theft deterrent system? You mean the forced entry system? Yeah, that's the one. Well, the passkey module does turn the security light on and off. Hold on, I uh, might just have something on that. Check it out. The universal theft deterrent system is available on several Buick models. The system is armed and it detects forced entry. The system pulses the horns and flashes all exterior lights on and off for about five minutes or until the system is switched off with either a keyless entry unlock transmission or by unlocking a door with the key. The arming sequence starts when the engine is shut off. As the door is opened, the module flashes the security light. But when the power door lock switch locks the doors and the door is closed, the security light goes on steady. After 30 seconds, the system is armed and ready for a forced entry. If forcible tampering occurs, a tamper switch is closed, completing a circuit to the rack module. The module energizes the light control module and also pulses the horn relay to flash the lights and sound the horns. Disarm the system with the keyless entry unlock transmission or unlock the door with the key. 
You know, another completely separate system that's run by the rack module is retained accessory power. Wait till you see this one, you'll love it. For 1994, retained accessory power is available on the Sabre and Park Avenue. Retained accessory power turns on when the ignition is turned off. Ten minutes of battery power is available for the power windows, sunroof and wipers on some models, and the radio, or until a door is opened. When the ignition is on, power operates the relays and accessories. When the ignition is turned off, the rack module starts an internal ten minute timer and turns retained accessory power relays one and two back on. Battery power is then available for ten minutes or until a door switch opens the circuit. Talk about retaining. I need to come in for a pit stop. Hey, I'll order some pizza. Cool, but no anchovies. Chuck, I'll be right back. I gotta go get something from my car. I'm gonna put anchovies on it anyway. Gosh, if we just took the highlights from all these programs, wouldn't that make a great know-how? Yeah, I'll ask the guys when they get back. Great stuff. Good yeah. pizza. I can't eat any more. I'm full. Mm. Somebody get me another beer. <laughs> so, guys, uh, that's my idea. You know, we take all the stuff we just talked about and make one huge know-how. Now, you mean just on mm -hmm. how stuff works? Yeah, nothing too technical, just the basics. You know, here's the system, there are the parts, and here's how it should operate. That would probably cut back on a lot of our comebacks. I like it. I mean, I think it'd be great for a new guy like me, you know, especially if you go back a few years. You know? mm -hmm. That's exactly what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. you know, I bet we could solve a lot of the little things just right there in the lane. Yeah, well, from what you guys have told me, you already got a pretty good handle on that. You know, last week, Bob brings in this customer, right? He thought he had a steering problem. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Check it out, Bob. In 1992, Buick introduced two new types of steering systems. On Park Avenue and LeSabre models, the system is known as two-flow electronic steering. On Roadmaster models, the system is known as variable effort steering. By regulating the amount of fluid leaving the power steering pump, these systems are able to regulate the amount of assist provided by the power steering system. When vehicles travel at low speeds, these systems provide maximum power assist. This helps drivers easily steer during low speed maneuvers. At highway speeds, these systems restrict fluid flow from the power steering pump, reducing steering assist. This provides drivers with a steering wheel that provides better road feel. The TFE system operates with either full power assist or a preset level of assist reduction unlike the VES system, which provides a constantly variable range of power assist. I hear the 95 RIV has a completely new system. Mm -hmm. Don't worry, the new RIV info is on the way. You're going to like that one. Heads up, Dave. Hey, I, cruise control. I really like this tape. Several different types of cruise control systems can be found on all Buicks. The vacuum servo system is used with the 1994 Skylark, LeSabre, and Park Avenue. A cruise control microprocessor senses vehicle speed and commands a vacuum servo assembly to maintain vehicle speed by opening or closing the throttle. The cruise on-off switch provides power to the system. The switch must be on for the system to operate. Pressing the set coast switch for at least 63 milliseconds engages cruise control and turns on the cruise light in the instrument panel. Once in cruise control, if the switch is pressed and held, the vehicle coasts. When released, the new slower speed is maintained. Applying the brake pedal temporarily disables the system. Two brake switches are used by the system to detect a disengage request by the driver. Cruise control is immediately disengaged. Pushing the resume accelerate switch for at least 63 milliseconds returns the vehicle to the previously set speed. 
If either the resume accelerate or set coast switch is pushed prior to achieving the set speed, a new set speed will be established. The vehicle accelerates if the resume accelerate switch is pushed and held. The vehicle accelerates until the switch is released. Then, a new set speed is established. An electro-motor cruise control system is used on 1991 to 1994 Roadmasters, 1994 Centuries, and 1994 Regals. The system is electronically controlled. Engine vacuum is not required. The vacuum servo and brake pedal switch vacuum release is not needed. Electromotor cruise control systems are operated by the driver exactly as vacuum servo systems. Electromotor cruise control units are mounted under the hood. The unit contains a cruise control module and an integral stepper motor. The stepper motor is connected to the throttle body linkage by the cruise control throttle cable. The stepper motor and cruise control throttle cable moves to open or close the throttle. Yeah, you know, another system that causes a lot of instant comebacks is the power window lockout switch. You wouldn't believe how many people hit that accidentally and then they think their power windows aren't working. It's really hard to explain that to a customer and still have everything turn out right. That's a good point, Bob. Mentioning that to a customer without making them feel foolish is no easy task. I know, I've been there too. I know. Let's talk about Bitsy. Hey, man, lay off. We just broke up yesterday. <laughs> no, not Betsy. Bitsy. The brake transaxle shift interlock. Oh, that thing. Yeah. Boy, when that came out, a lot of people thought they had a transmission problem. There's really not much to it. Dave, toss in that tape. Bitsy is a safety feature that was designed to prevent drivers from shifting the vehicle out of park unless the brake pedal is fully depressed. This decreases the possibility of pedal selection errors, which might result in unwanted acceleration. The Bitsy system locks the gear selector lever until the brake switch is activated. A solenoid is used to lock the gear selector lever. When the brake pedal is depressed, ground is removed from the solenoid which releases the gear selector lever. If the system becomes inoperative for any reason, it can be overridden. Turn the ignition key to the off position, then shift the transmission into the neutral position. The vehicle can now be started in the neutral position. Bob, that's pretty straightforward stuff. Well, yeah, that seems simple, but with all the new safety features, it's easy to get confused. Well, like safety belts, how many changes have they made to those in just the last few years? Yeah, safety belts. And how about airbags? Mm -hmm. The driver and passenger airbag system can be found on Park Avenue, LeSabre, and Roadmaster. Let's take a look at the Park Avenue and LeSabre system. The airbag indicator identifies proper system operation by flashing seven times after switching the ignition to run. The indicator stays on while starting. After starting, the indicator flashes six more times. If the light flashes less than seven times or stays on, the driver should consider this a warning that a system malfunction exists. The airbag will not deploy. The system should be serviced immediately. The system deploys the airbag under two simultaneous circumstances. First, the vehicle must be struck within an area 30 degrees either side of the front center line of the vehicle. Second, the vehicle must be struck with force equal to or greater than 14 miles per hour into a fixed barrier. Together, lap and shoulder belts and the knee bolster system are vital to successful protection. The belts hold the occupant in place. The knee bolster prevents submarining. Consult the know-how reference manual for further information. I have noticed that some of our customers aren't wearing their safety belts when they come in. I guess they just don't realize that airbags are only helpful when used with safety belts. Well, if everyone knew what that airbag warning light meant, I wouldn't have had that car in my stall today. I see a lot of customers getting confused over simple bulb checks. Yeah, the low oil light seems to be doing the same thing, confusing people. Dave, why don't you pop that tape in? The low oil level warning lamp can be found on most Buicks. An instrument panel light illuminates to warn the driver if the engine oil level has dropped more than one quart below full. The oil level check is performed once per ignition cycle. 
If the vehicle is parked on an incline where the front end is higher than the rear, a possible false low oil level reading may be indicated. Engine on and engine off timers are used to determine when to check the oil level two ways. One, the oil level is checked if the engine has been off for more than 30 minutes. And two, if the engine has been running for more than 12 minutes and then shut off, the module waits three minutes before checking the oil level. For LeSabre and Park Avenue, the oil level module checks the oil level during the one to three second bulb check. If the level is okay, the low oil light remains off. If the level is low, the module illuminates the low oil level light for 20 to 40 seconds. If the engine is restarted only five to eight minutes since it was switched off, the module waits to check the oil level at the next engine startup. On Roadmaster, the PCM monitors the oil level. Instead of engine off and engine running timers, the PCM monitors coolant temperature. The PCM looks at what the coolant temperature was when the engine was switched off and uses this as a starting point. When the PCM sees the coolant temperature drop to a predetermined temperature, the oil level is checked. If the level is low, the light is illuminated at the next startup. Okay, everyone, think. Are we missing anything? Nope. We've got it covered. About the only thing we haven't covered is Twilight Sentinel. Great. Let's hit it. The Twilight Sentinel system is designed so that when the switch is on and the system senses darkness, the system illuminates all exterior lights. It turns them off when it gets light out, too. Then, when you turn off the ignition, the system provides exterior lighting for up to three minutes. The Twilight Sentinel switch and Twilight Photocell are inputs to the light control module. When the Twilight Sentinel switch is on and the sun goes down, the module operates the exterior lights and dims the instrument panel lights on Rivieras. If the photo cell is covered by a newspaper or map during daylight hours, the sensor tells the system to turn on the headlights and dim the instrument panel lights. So when it gets dark, the photo cell resistance increases. The module waits 30 seconds, then turns the lights on. 30 seconds after the module sees a photocell resistance decrease, meaning that it gets lighter outside, the module turns the lights off. The system has a secondary convenience function. When the ignition is turned off, a delay feature, controlled by the driver, turns the lights on for a few moments. Well, guys, I guess that about uh, wraps it up. Yeah, yeah we did it. Thanks for having us over for the big game. Show. Hey, I am sorry, man. I mean, you know, I just got carried away, you know. But at least now I got some ammo to use on the boss Monday morning. Any kind, right, Chuck. Sir. All right. Peace. Drive safely. All right. See ya. Later. Geez, I wonder why I couldn't get the game on. Hey, hey, guys! Guys, I got the game. So, that's the whole idea. Well, I think it's great. But I think it's only fair to warn you, Chuck. This has got the potential of being really bad or really good. Make it work. Thanks. Oh, and uh, for all the details on this program, check out the manual.